Are you an aspiring creative in entertainment, business, fashion, design, or the arts? Do you want to elevate your creative passion project to the next level? Then this show is for you. Whether you want a career in television, film, radio, literature, music, or beyond, Creative Breakthrough will show you how to take your dreams and turn them into reality. This show will not only leave you feeling motivated and inspired, but also provide you real-life tools to pursue the creative journey you have always wanted. I'm your host, creative coach, and chicken wing lover, Shireen Kassab, a.k.a. The Funny Brown Girl. Yes, I have an unhealthy obsession with chicken wings. Now, get ready to flex your creative muscle. Today's episode is brought to you by HoorayForCBD.com. I struggle at night falling asleep. Thousands of thoughts keep me awake. A funny joke, a new podcast topic, an idea for a TV script, and the list goes on. To help me, someone recommended CBD, and I've never slept better. Not only do I get a good night's sleep now, I also wake up more refreshed and energized to conquer the day. CBD has been a game changer for me, from helping me sleep to calming me down when my anxiety creeps up on me. If you want to learn more about how CBD can help you, visit HoorayForCBD.com. Hey, welcome back to another episode of The Creative Breakthrough. I'm your host, Shireen Kassam. Hey, three quick announcements. One, don't forget there will be no Creative Breakthrough episodes for the next three weeks because I will be traveling through Kenya and South Africa talking about creativity and this podcast. How exciting is that? Thank you to the listeners for listening to this and making me popular in Africa. If you want to follow my trip adventures while I'm in Kenya and South Africa, you can follow me on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter at Funny Brown Girl. Also, as we approach summer, there are tons of opportunities coming up in the creative space, including casting, stand-up comedy festivals, and TV competitions. So if you're interested, don't forget to subscribe to my newsletter. I'm going to be posting um, another newsletter on Monday of this coming week before I leave for Africa with all of these opportunities in there. So make sure you subscribe. Go to funnybrowngirl.com forward slash subscribe. Okay, so let's get into it. This week, I had the opportunity to speak to James Lopez, the head of motion pictures at Will Packer Productions. In this episode, James hits on a variety of strategies that he utilized in his career at Atlantic Records, Sony Pictures, and now Will Packer Productions. From knowing when to pivot to transitioning into his dream role, James opens up about his journey. I'm honored and blessed James took the time out of his busy schedule to sit down and talk to me. James is an executive producer on the hit comedy Girls Trip, starring Regina Hall, Jada Pinkett Smith, Queen Latifah, and Tiffany Haddish. He's also the producer on Breaking In, starring Gabrielle Union, What Men Want, starring Taraji P. Henson, and Little, starring Issa Rae, Regina Hall, and Marseille Martin. It's out in theaters right now, so if you haven't seen, I strongly urge you to see it. It is hilarious. Lopez's films have grossed over $480 million at the box office, and this is not including what's coming in for Little. Formerly Senior Vice President of Marketing for Atlantic Records before joining Screen Gems, Lopez played an instrumental role in developing and overseeing the marketing campaigns for several multi-platinum artists, including T.I., during his award-winning tenure in the music business. James is also a member of the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts, and Sciences and has been included in Ebony Magazine's Power 100 list in Imagine Foundation's Most Powerful and Influential Latinos Entertainment. So what are we waiting for? Let's get started. Welcome to the guest chair, James. Thank you for having me. So one of the questions I like to start with all our guests is starting from the beginning. I'd love to know how and when your creative journey started. Um, I would say, uh, I mean, my first job in entertainment in the business um, was at Maverick Records uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, 1994. Um, I prior to that, actually, uh, no, actually, I should back up. I worked at a small record label in Austin, Texas, called Flashpoint. And at that record label, um, I met uh, a gentleman who was one of my early mentors, and he was hired by Maverick Records to be the head of Urban Music, and that was a man named Ed Strickland. Uh, I was always inquisitive as an assistant, and he remembered that when he moved to the West Coast. And uh, a few months after he made the move, he gave me a call and asked if I would be interested in moving to L.A. And absolutely, I jumped at that chance. 
And, uh, and, uh, you know, I moved out to LA with literally $500 in my pocket, a car full of clothes and a TV and no place to live. (laughs) And that was in 1994. Um, I crashed on a futon of a entertainment attorney named Francis Jones, who I barely knew, but was gracious enough to allow me to sleep on her futon in a, in a uh, spare room in her home um, until I found a place to live about three weeks later. But that was my first uh, dive into entertainment. Um, But I would say it started even before that. My passion uh, for entertainment and particularly music uh, was always huge when I was like in high school, going back to junior high. Like I was always interested in entertainment and music in particular. Uh, I wasn't particularly talented in any way. Like I couldn't really sing. I couldn't dance. Well, I, I could dance a little. I shouldn't say that. I was a, I was a pretty good dancer. Uh, I dabbled in DJing a little bit, but I was never going to be a performer or an entertainer. I knew that. But I, I was always interested in like the behind the scenes. Like uh, I can remember in high school figuring out that new music was released on Tuesdays. You know, new music now is Fridays, but it used to be back in the day, music was released on Tuesdays. So I would visit my local um, record store on Tuesdays. And I would just always ask, like, what's new, what was new that was out? And um, this is back in the era of 12 inches, you know, 12 inch rap singles. And I quickly started to notice that a lot of the rap records that I was l- loving were coming off of the same record labels like sleeping bag records profile you know cold chillin def jam um all these great records you know fourth and broadway all these great records were coming off of the same record labels so i started to buy records just based on you know uh visual impact like if I saw a 12 inch that had the Def Jam logo on it, I would buy it and not even know who the artist was and just discovered a lot of great music that way. Um, I was also born in the New York area, but raised in Texas. So some summers I would go back to New York and I'd come back to Texas with mixtapes, um, whether they be, uh, you know, whether they were Kid Capri or Clue, the mixes that were done on WBLS or on KISS FM, you know, Red Alert, uh, BLS, I believe, was Marley Mall. Um, I would bring these mixtapes back to Texas, you know, expose my inner circle of friends to all this new great music. I could remember calling the Houston radio stations after I'd heard Eric B. and Rakim uh, on a mixtape up in New York. And I called the radio station all that fall after I got back from visiting Bro. And they wouldn't play it because they didn't know who it was. And I'm like, how could you, like, New York Radio is playing it, play this record, and they didn't have it. Um, and months later, they started playing Eric Green and Rock Kim for the first time. So I realized, oh, crap, I'm my school's tastemaker. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm, I'm first. <laughs> so I would have the new dances first. I would, you know, talk, you know, I would, I would know what the new fashions were first in my school. So, I, you know, I'd be rocking Fila track suits. Oh, I remember those, the ones that go swish, swish, swish. <laughs> so I'd be rocking feel a track suit and hearing the new Eric B. and Rock Kim or set the Sonic song. Um, so that kind of became that guy for my school. Um, but in doing that, I also, you know, was, just became intrigued about these independent record labels that were putting out this music. And I would read liner notes. And then the guy at the record store said, you know, if you want to find out more about the music business, you should read this magazine called Billboard. So I would never buy it, but there would always be copies of Billboard at the record store. So I would sit in the record store and read it cover to cover. And then I'd leave (laughs) and started to learn, you know, about industry names and heads of record labels and production companies and producers and writers and just about the business, uh, reading that industry trade. So when I was in college, I kept that up. When I got out of school, I went to Sam Houston State University. I graduated in 1991 with a general business degree. Being parents of immigrants, I mean, being a son of immigrants and, you know, 
uh, blue collar, uh, hardworking people, uh, first generation born American. The dream was to just get a white collar job, have benefits and, you know, have a steady job. That's it. That's what was expected. Mm -hmm, Um, and that was a step forward from the generation before us. Um, I didn't want to do that. <laughs> uh, I didn't want to be stuck in a cubicle, which I was when I got out of college. And, uh, you know, wearing my little white collared button down shirt and my khakis and, and working in a call center with a degree. And I was like, this can't be it. I can't do this. And I answered an ad for a publicity job at a record label independent record label. Didn't get that job, but I was called back for an executive assistant position, got the job. Those people who called me in for the job started a new record label in Austin. And that's where I met, you know, uh, my first uh, major influence as an executive at Strickland. And that brought me to LA, like I said, to work for Maverick Records. Um, So I was, you know, in rap promotions at Maverick Records. And then um, I quickly realized I was horrible at it. (laughs) I wasn't good on calling on radio stations, begging them to play my records. Uh, What I realized when I was there is that I had a brain for like packaging and marketing and figuring out the total packaging of an artist and bringing them to the marketplace. So I enjoyed that. And my next job um, at a small record label called Wild West Records in L.A., I got a chance to do that. But we were so small. We literally only had like, I think, five employees. We were, because we were so small, you got the opportunity to do everything. So sales, marketing, retail, retail marketing, video promotion, radio promotion, you know, product management, publicity. You had to do it all because we were so small. And that's where I kind of developed my chops for total packaging of artists and marketing. And my next job was was with uh, Delicious Vinyl Records, working with the Far Side, Brand New Heavies, the Who Riders, Born Jamaicans. Um, And I worked for Rick and Mike Ross. Uh, Delicious Vinyl was the home to Tone Loke, to Young MC. Um, So it had a rich early history in hip hop. Um, It was a legendary L.A. record label on Sunset Boulevard. You know, I really came into my own there as a senior director of marketing. And they were distributed at the time by a company called Red Ant, uh, which was run by Al Teller, a legendary music guy, used to be at Columbia Records and MCA. Um, And Randy Phillips, who managed Tony Braxton um, and later ended up managing Usher and uh, was actually involved in putting that last Michael Jackson tour together when Michael passed away. So I worked for those guys there for a brief moment, maybe a year and a half. And then from there, um, Atlantic Records came calling. They were looking for a senior director of marketing. You know, they wanted me to move to the New York office. And uh, my first conversation with Craig Kalman, uh, I really wasn't interested in moving to New York. Mm-hmm. Um, I had just gotten married at a small infant and I was like, I don't want to uproot my family. Then about another six months passed and Craig came to LA again for some meetings and a longtime friend of mine, Mike Karen, who's now is the head of worldwide a r for Warner Brothers, uh, for Warner Music Group, told me, you know, you should really sit down with Craig again. Um, just hear what he's got to say. So I sat down. And they flew me to New York, and I had a whirlwind day of meetings in New York. And they were in the process of signing Sinead O'Connor to a new record deal at Atlantic. And so there was like a party for her, so they took me to that. And I sat in a corner booth with Sinead O'Connor, Craig Kalman, and the legendary Ahmet Erdogan. And Ahmet, for your listeners who may not know who he is, Ahmet was the founder of Atlantic Records. Bald man glasses. You probably saw him in the movie Ray, uh, giving line reads to Ray when he was uh, recording Mess Around. Um, So uh, Ahmed was legendary, you know, signed Aretha Franklin, Ray Charles, the Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin, and the list goes on and on. Just legendary music guy um, and one of the pillars of the music business. Um, 
And uh, just sitting there talking to him, I, you know, I was like, I'm sold. Like, I want to join this legendary family. Um, so I moved to New York and this was in 2000. And uh, I rose up pretty quickly. I worked directly for a man named Ronnie Johnson, who was became a lifelong friend and, and probably the biggest influence in my professional career mentor. So I worked for Ronnie um, and we had an incredible run at Atlantic Records with multiple platinum artists and great campaigns. And, you know, my biggest, I, I guess my biggest achievement as a, as a music executive was overseeing the career of T.I. Um, I met Tip after his first album, after he was uh, finished his deal over at Arista. He released one album that wasn't successful. Um, and he was shopping for a new deal. And my job the day that we were trying to sign him was to keep him away from Puffy and Jay-Z because they were also signed, trying to sign him. <laughs> so I was my first introduction to, to Tip was uh, I was told, OK, we're trying to sign this kid and he needs to hang out with you all day long. And I'm like, what am I supposed to do with them? Uh, they're like, just keep them busy. <laughs> So took him shopping, went to eat, hung out, took him to a friend's house. Like I had to keep him busy all day long until I got a call right around midnight saying, OK, it's official. He signed. You know, we obviously had Missy Elliott. We had Sean Paul. We had Fat Joe, Trick Daddy, Trina, uh, Twista, Fabulous, um, Brandy. We, you know, we had a great urban roster at Atlantic during that period of time um, in its heyday. And we just had one platinum hit after the next. Um, so during that time at Atlantic, I, uh, I caught the film bug, I would say, probably 2006, um, hanging around set of T.I.'s first album, uh, excuse me, first film, um, ATL. And just watching the process, um, music business was going through a little bit of turmoil at the time uh, because of digital music and trying to figure out what Apple Music was going to be um, and iTunes and selling singles for 99 cents and album sales were plummeting and people were getting let go and mergers were happening. So there was a lot of uh, consolidation in the music business starting to happen. And I just naturally said to myself, OK, what's next? Um I started to lose my passion for the music a little bit um, and the lifestyle uh, wasn't conducive to being a family guy. So um, I thought, you know, I was, I always had a curiosity about film and television and I thought that that would be the next natural step for me. Um, so I started to study it from afar. I mean, I, I literally bought a couple of books um, started reading the trades, Variety, Hollywood Reporter, um, and, uh, you know, just, um, started just to, you know, try to make as many contacts in the film business as possible. I would volunteer my services to read scripts and give notes or, or do coverage, even though I didn't know what I was doing at first. Um, but what I was doing was training myself to be a development exec and just had a thirst for the business. I'm like, this is what I want to do next. I didn't know how quite I was, you know, I didn't quite know how I was going to get there. You know, the, the, the power base of the film business was in Los Angeles. I was living in the New York area. So there were a lot of, you know, obstacles. Um, but the one thing I tell people when they're looking for a career change is to utilize anything that is is in your current field that you think may be applicable to what you want to do. So what I did was I looked around and I said, look, I work at Atlantic Records. Most people are going to pick up the phone for me because I could just say James Lopez from Atlantic Records um, to get your foot in the door. <laughs> and then um, Another thing I utilized is uh, video production as a way to train myself on physical production. So I started taking a larger role in producing the music videos that we were putting out at Atlantic. Um, and I also realized that being involved with soundtracks would hopefully help me make contacts at studios. 
So that's what I did. I started to become more involved in soundtracks um, and uh, in doing video production. So through my involvement in music and films and soundtracks, it's, it's how I met my first boss in the film business, Clint Culpepper, who was the president of Screen Gems. And we did a film, we did a soundtrack for a film called Nick and Nora's Infinite Playlist, which was released through Screen Gems. And that's how I first met him. Um, and then it just so happened the next project that T.I. was doing as an actor was a film called uh, Takers. And that was being released by Screen Gems. Screen Gems was producing that film. And my relationship with Will and Clint started because of Takers. Um, so I was really involved in the marketing of that film through music, um, sitting in marketing meetings at Sony Pictures, um, and just kind of learning the language of the film business and studying it from afar. And the more and more uh, I started talking to Clint, the more we found that we had a lot of things in common in terms of, of just music and our love for music and music and film and how to marry the two. Um, and just through, you know, just through conversations, it just come, you know, it just came up. He just asked what I want to do next. And I said, I want to, I want to be a production executive. It was the spring of 2010 when he went to Michael Linton, the chairman of Sony uh, Pictures Entertainment, and uh, I got a call into Michael's office June of 2010, um, and we had a great meeting. And in that meeting, he said, look, I, I, I see what, what Clint sees in you, and, and we need people like you here at the studio. Then I got a call from HR literally a week later, and they called me to back to Sony to the lot, and I knew it was going to go down then. And uh, what I did not know was, um, you know, I received my employee packet, my, my binder from HR with the offer letter and what the job title was. I didn't open it until I got to the parking lot. <laughs> and I assumed that I was being hired in marketing. Cut to I'm in the parking lot at Sony Pictures and I open the binder and I'm thinking it's a marketing job because that's what people see me as, a marketing person. Um. And when I opened the binder, it said senior vice president of production. And I was floored. I was like, oh, my God, they let me in. <laughs> <laughs> they let me in the door. Um, and, you know, that was that's how I started my film career. 2010, the first project I was assigned um, when I got to Screen Gems was development of the Think Like a Man script. You know, it's 2018 now, and I believe I'm on my 14th film. I believe 14th or 15th, um, which is incredible uh, when I look back on the fact that I've only been doing it eight years and that many films I've been involved with. Um, it's been a blessing. Um, and, I, you know, I take none of it for granted. Um, I'll say to your listeners, uh, as a word of advice, um, like I said before, um, you got, you have to visualize what your next step is in your career development. Just because you're in accounting or marketing or some other area and you aspire to be in a different area in your company, um, you have to do the job before someone pays you to do the job. So what I mean by that is when I was in the music business, my home office was f stacked with scripts that I was reading at night and on weekends after my day job. No one was paying me to do that. No one was paying me to go hang out on set and observe. Um, I was basically putting myself through an apprenticeship. I was putting in the research and the time and visualizing and studying what I wanted to be. I get approached by so many people saying, Nobody will give me a chance or how can I do this or how can I do that? And when I ask them, what steps are you taking to achieve your goal? And I get this blank stare and I'm like, oh, you just want somebody to put you on. Mm -hmm. That's yep. not work. That no, that's, I'm sorry, but I'm not that generous. Mm -hmm. 
Like I, 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 I take pride in giving people a lot of, you know, wh- whether it be job recommendations or, or a leg up or an opportunity throughout my career. There, there are a lot of people out there that I've helped that, that they don't know that I helped them um, just by me putting in a call or whatever. Um, but I see that they're, that they're working hard towards their goal. They want it. Um, for someone to just want it and not actually be doing anything to actually work towards that, that person doesn't want it bad enough, apparently. Um, so if you want to write and you've only written one script and you've worked on that one script for two or three years of your life, that's great. That's a great accomplishment that you finish a script, but then you move on to the next one. You always have to constantly be writing. Your first script is not going to be the best one that you write. You're going to get better every time you do it. So you have to constantly do that. If you want to direct and you haven't even attempted to shoot a short, then how are you going to direct? You know, if you want to act and I get approached by would be actors all the time and I ask them a simple question, have you done any stage play work? Are you doing any community theater? Is there like a, 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 per, a local production um, troupe? Is there an improv class? You know, are you are you and some friends just trying to put together something in front of the camera? You know, uh, like, what are you doing locally? And they just look at you. I'm like, so let me get this straight. You want to be cast in a Hollywood film, but you've done nothing where you live. Not one thing. How is that? How are you going to take that leap? And, you know, with today's technology and YouTube and cameras, camera phones, you know, there's nothing stopping you from creating. There's nothing stopping people from getting their passions out. And whether the world sees them or not, it's another thing you have to be confident enough to put it out there. But at least for yourself, at least to put in the time, um, you have to do something about it. You can't just wait on the hookup. Um, so that is my advice to your listeners and something that I've always practiced in my career is I'm always looking forward and trying to figure out how am I going to get to my next goal? How am I going to, what steps am I going to take? How hard am I going to work? How much time am I going to put in to get to there? Um, and, 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 you know, sometimes you have to do you have to practice what you want to be before someone pays you to do it. Um, I had a young lady, I spoke at on the lot at Sony one time and I gave some advice to someone who was, I believe they were in HR and they came up to me and said, you know what? I really have great marketing ideas and I feel like my path would be to be in theatrical marketing. Like I want to help market films. How do I do that? And I said, well, you actually work at Sony Pictures. You are here. So you have an advantage over people on the outside who can't get through the gates. So I said, just reach out to someone in marketing and just really ask if it would be okay for you to observe a marketing meeting one day, for you to just be a fly on the wall so that you can learn the process, so that you can learn how they do things um, and tell them that you wish to join their group one day. You want to be in their division one day. And then put together what you feel would be an effective marketing plan for that film. You don't have to actually necessarily show it to them, but go through the exercise. And if you have a close relationship with someone in marketing, slip it to them and show them, say, look, this is what I put together for this movie. And that person may give you notes. They may say, wow, this is great. This is amazing. You you, you should work in this group. Or we don't do things like that. You know, this is the way we, it's done. But at least it shows initiative. Like, don't wait for someone to pay you to do it. Just do it for yourself. Figure out if you have the chops to do that particular job. Um, and that way, eventually, you will start preparing yourself to segue into that division. That's what I did with film. I spent, from the from the time that I decided, I think I want to do this next after I'm done with music 
That was in 2006. I didn't get my first film job until 2010. So four years of just like studying, reading scripts. Like when I walked through those Sony gates, my first day, I'd, I'd read over 300 scripts in that four year period. And, you know, when I started doing a job, I realized I didn't know half of what I thought I did. Um, it came by experience um, and I'm always constantly learning, but at least I set a foundation for myself before I got that job. So that's the biggest piece of advice I would give in terms of career development and career advancement um, is to study the field that you aspire to be in even before someone pays you to do that. You talked a little bit about your highs and your wins, like working with TI and moving out of marketing into production. What are some of the challenges that you faced on your creative journey? I guess just being underestimated. Um, but I, I actually, you know what? I don't see it as a challenge, to be honest with you. Um, you know, I find it to be an advantage when you walk into a room and expectations are low. And because it allows me to like, I feel like I, I'm working with knowledge, with a knowledge advantage that that other person doesn't have because, you know, they're not expecting certain results. Um, you know, it's, it's, I have to say, I haven't had that many obstacles in terms, look, as a man of color in this, you know, in corporate America and dealing with big budgets and all that, I mean, sometimes you, you don't get the same type of budgets that other productions get. Um, you know, sometimes you hear, oh, well, you know, the majority of the cast is African or people of color are African American. So, you're not going to get the same type of budget because we can't sell foreign. So therefore the budget number comes down. Therefore you have to make the movie for less money than you would like to, because they feel they can't do foreign box office. Like that is frustrating. That part of the business, there still needs to be a lot of work done in that area. Um, obviously black Panther broke down a lot of doors internationally, but you know, I, I don't want to say that's an anomaly, but it is a Marvel superhero character. So um, we have more work to do, um, but that's just one, another brick that's been knocked off the wall to try to get us over. An issue that really sticks in my craw because I came from music where our artists traveled the world and sold albums all over the world and their music was enjoyed all over the world and they would sell out arenas in the very same markets where sometimes we can't get enough screens to get the movie out. Um, so that's, that's frustrating. Um, but I would say that's the number one issue I think for me as a person of color in the film business is way in which the films that we work on are treated internationally. But I, I would say Obstacles, hurdles um, for people of color, and particularly black folks in the film business as a whole, that is the number one um, issue for all of us collectively is that we are not marketed, we are not promoted, we are not treated equally in terms of the international box office regarding our films. Um, and we still have more work to do. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's one film at a time. I think those barriers will start to come down. Um, you know, getting, getting the foreign marketplace, um, used to seeing us or used to us being marketed in a certain way. I want to go back to something you said earlier. You said you rose up really quickly at Atlantic Records. Um, you are on the, um, Academy of Motion Pictures, Art and Sciences, and you were also named Most Powerful and Influential Latino in Entertainment. You've talked a little bit about, well, not you've, you've given a, some good advice on how you've navigated the space, but I'm curious, like, what would you say is like your top one or two um, traits that has gotten you on the map and has allowed you to be so, succe so successful in the industry? Um, I think I work hard. Like, you know, I, I, you know, there were a lot of people earlier on in my career in music that I saw rise a lot faster than me. A lot of my peers 
rose a lot faster than I did. They had bigger jobs, more money. Um, but I also saw a lot of people taking shortcuts, not working as hard and more worried about shining and balling out of control, but not really putting in the work. Um, and also not preparing themselves for, for the, you know, the fact that the music business could, that it changed on a dime. Um, and there's a lot of people now who I came up with in the music business who are out of entertainment completely because they didn't prepare. Um, so I pride myself on always trying to think of the next, always being prepared, uh, studying, working hard, being respectful, definitely not stepping on people on the way up, um, giving a hand when I can. I feel that I'm, you know, I'm pretty humble. Um, and that, um, you know, I, I just try to conduct myself a certain way, respectful, and 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 I think I uh, I I also you know operate from a place of fear. I'm you know I'm fearful of being out one day. You know I'm fearful of not not being able to do what I love to do. So I just try to stay as humble as I can. I work as hard as I can and try to be as reliable as I can. Um, and that has taken me a long way. Um, I've never been the guy to try to take the shortcut because I always feel like if I do, it's not going to work out for me. So I just don't do it. Do you think in your role now at Will Packard and even on being on the, being a member, you'll have some, you'll be able to influence that at all? Or do you think there's a movement right now in Hollywood to influence that? I think there's a movement. I think I think it's a great time for people of color in Hollywood. You know, there's a lot of there's still a lot of work to do in terms of diversity in the executive suites and the decision making and financing and distribution. That that we're woefully behind in those areas. But as I tell people who are in the business, they're not mm -hmm. nobody's gonna do it for us. We just have to figure out a mechanism. You know, like we got enough powerful people in this business. Um to build institutions on our own. Um, so, but as far as creative, as far as the creators, um, it's a golden era, I think, right now. You've got so many talented people creating not only amazing content, but opportunities for others to come up underneath them. You know, you've got the Issa Rays, Donald Glovers, you've got Ava, you know, who hires female directors on every single episode of Queen Sugar for the last three years. Now, those a lot of those female directors were told no by studios or networks before, but they got the opportunity with Ava, and now they're going on to direct other things because they're being discovered through their work on Queen Sugar. It takes people like that to create opportunity. It takes people like my partner, Will, you know, who, who has put a lot of people to work in front and behind the camera. So I think it's the golden era for that. Um, we still don't control the purse strings and we still don't control the distribution mechanism, but we'll get there in time. So last question before we go to lightning round, what is your final piece of advice that you would give to creatives of color on their journey? Always create and do not let anyone tell you or stop you from creating. There are no excuses. Like there's too much technology out there that allows you to put something on camera. There's nothing stopping you from sitting in front of a computer and writing a script and then writing another one. There's nothing to stop you from being creative. Now, there are gatekeepers to having your stuff exposed on a mass level, um, but you have to keep at it. You have to keep at it until you hit that breakthrough. So keep creating no matter what. Stop. Do not look for excuses and do not wait for someone to put you on. Um Issa Rae did not wait on anybody to put her on. She took awkward black girl out to the internet, and that ended up becoming insecure years later. Um, she decided she had a story to tell. She was funny. Um, and she decided, I'm going to put this on the internet, and people are going to consume it. And people did, and she was found. They sought her out because she had an audience. Um so I would say that that is my parting words for creatives is don't let anybody stop you from putting out your art. Just work on your art and put it out yourself. And if it's good, it'll go viral. It'll spread. People will talk about it. People will discover. 
if it goes nowhere, then that might be telling you something that you may have to start over uh, or come up with a new idea. But there's nothing stopping you from putting it out. So put it out. Good advice. So we'll go on to the lightning round. Lightning round, I'm going to ask you five rapid fire questions and just tell me the first thing that comes to your mind. What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? The smartest person in the room is the one that does, the one that realizes what they don't know. What is a, I mean, and you've done a lot of reading, so this may be, this may be hard for you to pick one, but what is a written or verbal resource you would recommend creatives on their journey to read or listen to? Like, I love reading about mobile. So like, Bernie Brillstein's uh, um, autobiography, uh, Michael Ovitz, David Geffen, uh, Quincy Jones, Sidney Poitier, all these people um, I've read books on. Um, and I'm always, I've always been fascinated with just the culture of, of entertainment business and how people reach the heights that they, that they did. Um, I, I just, I'm just fascinated about reading about their journeys. Well, that's the next question. Who inspires you and why? I would say there's two people early on in their careers that, that inspired me when I was first coming into the game and music is Russell Simmons and, um, and uh, uh, Rick Rubin and how they started Def Jam out of a dorm room um, and how they hustled um, that work ethic, um, the luck, the craziness that they went through. But it was such a creative time and a new frontier uh, for all those independent labels in, in the 80s. So I, I would say Russell and Rick. What is a habit that's helped you on your journey? It's not really a habit, but it's something that I, I, I have an inner conversation with myself to never get too big for your britches. Like, I, I'm just, I always have this inner conversation with myself um, that I'm not as dope as, as people say you are. So keep working. <laughs> Very true. Okay. And last question, yeah. what do you want your legacy to be? It's real simple. It's like, you know, I want people to say that I was a good person, that I was extremely creative and that was helpful, and that I did good work and was respectful in doing and achieving everything that I achieved. Like I, I don't I don't want I don't want there ever to be someone that feels like I did them wrong or I stepped over them or I, or I did dirty business. Like I try to pride myself on being good standing and good character when it comes to business. So I want that to be my legacy. Like that guy was always an upstanding guy. So James, if our listeners wanted to follow your journey, where can they find you online? Um, I'm on Instagram at I am James F as in Fernando Lopez. Um, I'm on Facebook. Um, I don't post too often. Um, but that is the best place to find me. Cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Hey, before you hit pause, did you find this episode helpful and enjoyable? If so, could you leave an Apple podcast, aka iTunes review? It'll take you less than one minute and mean the world to me. The more ratings and reviews the show gets, the more people are able to find this podcast. If you're unsure how to leave a review, no worries. If you're on your iPhone or iPad, go to the homepage of this show and scroll down to write a review. Click on it and you'll be able to rate and review the show. If you're on a Mac from iTunes, go to the show homepage and on the top, click ratings and reviews. Also, please subscribe to get the latest episodes once they drop. If you enjoy the episode and know someone who would love it, please share. From your iPhone, click on the icon with three dots and then share via social media, email or text. If you want to hear more, head over to funnybrowngirl.com forward slash podcast. You can also find me online. I'm on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Funny Brown Girl. Also, sign up for my free newsletter for more tips to advance your creative journey at funnybrowngirl.com forward slash subscribe. And again, if you enjoyed the show, do me a favor and subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. Now, go flex your creative muscle and keep winning. Thank you for listening. See you next week. <laughs>